Um, so I'm here representing the, the surveillance working group. So we've been working on recommendations uh, for improving cholera surveillance for the past year or so. And I wanted to give you an overview of some of the initial guidance, where we are today, the importance of it, and then also hoping to have a little bit of a discussion to, to get your feedback. I know it's before lunch, so if we need to continue afterwards, maybe the chairs will let us do so. Uh, so why do we need timely and reliable cholera surveillance data? Uh, I think everyone here knows we need to, particularly in, in outbreaks, ensure a quick response. We also need it more on the medium to long term to think about uh, long term planning with national cholera plans, et cetera, and then tracking our progress. So um, even today, looking at CFRs that Philippe presented, if you don't have comparable data today and yesterday and tomorrow, it's it's pretty hard to say whether you're doing better or worse. Um, so we published uh, provisional guidance from the surveillance working group in February, and this guidance is really focused on the minimum recommendations for what to collect and how to analyze surveillance data. It's, we recognize that there are a lot more data to collect, and many countries choose to do so, but really this is kind of setting the minimum bar for what you really need to achieve these objectives. Uh, so we really see this as a, as a cycle going from data collection to analysis to dissemination, um, then actually operationalizing and then going again as, as you have more and more cholera seasons or, or outbreaks. Uh, to refresh um, folks' memory, if, if you haven't seen the provisional guidance, there's, there's, we still have this kind of two-pronged definition for a suspected case where uh, in the absence of a probable or confirmed cholera outbreak, anyone with acute watery diarrhea, severe dehydration who is above, who is two years old or greater is considered a cholera, a suspected cholera case, or someone who dies from AWD with no other known causes. The idea of having this age limit and needing severe dehydration is to have a bit more specificity in the case definitions. We know there are other reasons why people will have acute watery diarrhea, um, particularly in, in young young kids, and we want to minimize these false alerts unless there's really cholera there. But once cholera is confirmed or the, a probable outbreak, which we can discuss later, um, we consider anyone who is an acute watery diarrhea case to be a suspected cholera case. And we, we think of surveillance as happening in two distinct areas, uh, as presented today already from, from Nigeria and, and from Mozambique. In, in health facilities and in the community. So it's, it's really a two-pronged approach to surveillance. So we define health facilities in these guidelines as any, basically anywhere that cholera cases seek care, um, public, private, NGOs, faith-based organizations. Uh, this, this doesn't include pharmacies, which I think in, in some in some places may, may be kind of at the border between health facilities and not. Um, and we recommend collection of the standard case-based data are really age, sex, location, um, some data on symptom onset time and symptoms, um, whether they're an inpatient or outpatient, dehydration level and their outcome. Um, and, and we consider out three, three types of outcomes, uh, alive, died at health facility, and dead on arrival. Obviously, there's transfer and other things that are subsets of these, but these are the three main outcomes that we care about when thinking about people's survival. And uh, also laboratory information. So not only positive, negative, but as even as we saw in, uh, I think, Nigeria's line list, they have separate columns for RDT, for culture, et cetera. And so really saying what tests were performed and what, uh, what the outcomes were. Um, and then in community-based surveillance, it's, it's a little bit lighter. Uh, we, the, the recommendation is to collect cases and deaths by age group, so under two and, and two and above, and um, whether they refer to health facility or not, and cholera, 
community cholera deaths are those deaths that occur in the community, uh, and that includes on the way to health facilities. And so I think this is maybe the most important slide. Well, one of the most important slides, it's very simple, but there's a lot of heterogeneity in how cholera deaths are reported through countries. And the recommendation is to stay simple and to report facility deaths as anyone who dies in the facility. So if you die five minutes after arriving, you're a facility death. If you, arrive, if you die two days after arriving, like we saw in Uvira, you're also a facility death. We recognize that this, that, you know, the, the attribution of blame uh, of why someone died may differ between someone who dies a minute after and, and two days later, but to have some standard definitions is really important. Um, and then if someone arrives at a, uh, sorry, if someone arrives at a health facility dead or dies in the community, they should be recorded as a community-based death. And one of the big recommendations is not only do we record them separately, but we also analyze them separately. And so mixing the two um, can, can lead to some misleading results. Um, we've, we know that community-based deaths are going to likely be reported far more than community-based cases. So when you take the ratio of those two, like a CFR is going to be skewed unless you analyze them separately. So when we think about analyzing these data, as I mentioned, they should be analyzed separately, but interpreted together. Um, and really, it's basic epi. Um, so it's really describing who, who the cases are, who the deaths are by age, sex. Um, we, we see by age group. Uh, keep in mind what we saw today is when we think about age groups, if you just say under five, over five, we, we saw all of these really high risks among people over 60. So if you collapse, if you make really uh, broad age groups, you can lose those trends. So it's really important to think about the age, uh, place, time, and, and the key indicators that are recommended are incidents, the, the percent inpatient levels of dehydration, so the percent on different plans, and the, the hospitalized case fatality ratio, so the clinic-based case fatality ratio. Uh, just to point out why we need to, when, when we, when reporting deaths, uh, if you look across, we, we looked across various sit reps from ongoing outbreaks and in reports from, from several different countries and found that there really seems to be, and, and similar to the, the systematic review that was, was reported on first this morning, there's really a lack of detail in reporting of deaths. It's often X deaths and, and no more. And, and we need to know who's dying. So are there specific age groups dying, specific facilities that have higher CFRs than others? And are there time trends? Um, for instance, in Uvira today, I before actually looking at the data from Uvira, my, my guess would have been that you always find more deaths at the start of outbreaks or the start of seasons because people aren't ready, you know, case management procedures aren't put in place. What we found in Uvira was actually not that at all which was surprising to me. And so having these types of data allows you to ask these questions and, and enhance clinical surveillance or clinical management in the future. Um, and so who's not currently captured by the minim minimum recommendations right now are people arriving late at facilities. So we're, we're not, the minimum recommendations don't say you need to collect the hour of arrival or the, the time from arrival till outcome. So it's important to note, some countries may choose to do that and analyze that separately, but that's not part of the minimum recommendations. If people feel strongly that it should be on the revision, that's certainly something that we're open to and we wanna hear from you. Um, are people with specific comorbidities dying? So this is captured on the case report forms that were presented before, but again, not part of the minimum recommendations. And pregnancy, that's not, part of the minimum mm -hmm. recommendations. So collecting whether someone's pregnant or not is not there. Um, and who is dying from cholera in the community? So we also, we can, from the community-based surveillance, we can start to get at who's dying or who, who the cases are. But again, as, as I presented before, the recommendation is under two and over two for community-based surveillance, which isn't gonna give much resolution. But all of these recommendations are really a balance of how 
heavy recommendations we can give for the minimums and what's practical by community-based surveillance officers and what works with current systems that are in place for community-based surveillance. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think this is, this is probably clear to everyone, but there's, there's a lot of reasons why these data can be helpful and, and just improving patient care. I think we're running low on time, so I'm not gonna go over all of these. Um, and, and so it's really, these data can be helpful both in the short term acutely to actually improve patient care in a specific outbreak at the health facility level and also be used longer term to have more reliable data to plan for the next outbreak or next season and to track progress. So uh, key messages are we just need to do better at capturing cholera deaths and cholera cases more systematically um, and, and trying to really use them to feed back to, to use in, in case management. And we're hoping that with the new up, update from the, 2020, the February 2023 recommendations that we can do a better job in, in reflecting the needs of the case management community uh, to, to make sure that we have data to, to improve patient care. So thank you and that is it.